Welcome to the Onyx Report, a program that critically analyzes the experiences, histories, and perceptions of black males in American society across age, class, region, sexuality, and profession. I'm your host, Dr. T. Hassan Johnson, Associate Professor of Africana Studies at Fresno State, black male studies scholar, and black male advocate. In the program, we examine current events and major issues using an empirically driven black masculinist theoretical lens thus including such concepts as the black male dual economy, anti-black misandry, phallicism, the subordinate male target hypothesis, and the black dynarchy. Our goal is to remind people, including black men themselves, of black men's humanity. Join us every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Pacific, either on YouTube or innerlightradio.com. All right, people, welcome back to the Onyx Report. This is Dr. T. Hassan Johnson. It is uh, Wednesday, June 3rd. I uh, hope everybody is doing as, as well as possible. Um, obviously, it's been a very crazy time um, as we've tried to manage not only through this pandemic and the quarantine, uh, and, and, and they're obviously connected, but hell, you can separate them in terms of the specific issues many of us are grappling with. And then, of course, we now have to deal with uh, the realities of the struggles against injustice, racial injustice in particular, that have uh, really, uh, what I'm glad to say, have taken root, uh, especially amongst um, or across generations in the black community. So you have people protesting. Uh, and yet, in the midst of all of that, we also have to be clear that there is more than protesting going on. Uh, we have saboteurs, we have uh, agent provocateurs, we have people who are really just taking advantage of the opportunity to cause havoc. And, and, and if it gets blamed on black protesters, nobody really cares. We have uh, people who are interested in destroying their own businesses to get uh, uh, insurance checks. We have people that um, I would argue have likely been hired to uh, cause certain types of damage. It's, it's, it's been chaotic in terms of really parsing through who's actually acting on what agenda and, and what actions are tied to which movements. Because we have overlapping ideas, overlapping things people are doing. And that's not even to include uh, members of the alt-right uh, who are taking advantage of the, uh, the, the chaos to initiate violence against black folk. So there's all kinds of things going on and there are so many stories uh, that it can be hard to keep us perspective on all of it. Uh, so I, I want to start this broadcast by wishing everybody as well as possible um, that you are safe and that your families are as safe as, as can be in the midst of all that we're enduring, right? Especially as Trump has really threatened uh, protesters with a military response. I want everybody to take heart and definitely uh, connect with those who share your agenda and, and moving forth to um, kind of expose these injustices that we're experiencing and challenge them um, because we've been accepting them long enough. Um, so as I tend to do with the Onyx Report, I'd like to start with some current events just to give people a sense of what uh, may be something to consider. But today's show is, is entitled, It Ain't No Fun When the Lion Has the Gun, Black Men and Big Game Hunting, right? So we're gonna talk about black men as big game and really the response of seeing black men in the streets, right? As this show is obviously focused on black men, I do so unapologetically. Whereas in other areas to, to focus on black men is considered an affront, it's considered uh, a, an offense. Uh, I do so without apology. Um, that is my research, that is my work, uh, and that is what I, I think is important to draw out in this discussion. In the midst of these um, uprisings, because we have uprisings and riots, you know, depending on, again, on people's agendas, but as far as the people that I align myself with who are pushing for justice, um, those I consider uprisers, those people who are engaged in uprising, one of the things that I noticed is that over the last five or six years, uh, that protests tend to be gendered in ways we don't often think about, right? We talk about, you know, gendered, and when we use that term, we usually are invoking women. Uh, sometimes we're invoking LGBT, but we rarely invoke uh, cisgendered heterosexual males, particularly black males. And I do so because one of the things I found since 2015 and onward, you know, when I began to really, and I'm not saying it hasn't happened prior to that, but 
when I would watch, you know, protests happening across the country, one of the things I noticed is when men would show up in equal numbers or more with women, that's when I started to see the police show up in riot gear. More often than not, when they showed up with tanks and paramilitary, you know, arm, arm, uh, 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 you know, they're armed in military garb and so on and so forth, it usually tended to coincide with the male presence at these protests. So my argument is that these protests, you know, are, are highly gendered in that uh, the more men that show up, the more physical threat there is in terms of the response by law enforcement. And so that said, um, I want people to be very aware that to dismiss men from the dialogue as far as uh, the impact of protests and the impact of gender on protest is to confuse the issue in terms of the likelihood of um, there being uh, a violent response because male presence uh, alone seems to initiate that. And you can look at Jim Sedanius's work as a rationale for that because there is one in terms of the identification of black males as the primary threat in a given situation, which again is why I titled this, It Ain't No Fun When The Lion Has The Gun, because black males have been the lion. And we've been the lion for centuries in terms of being killed, lynched, and put on display, right? The overwhelming majority of lynchings that took place from slavery onto the middle of the 20th century involved the, you know, removal or the uh, molestation of, of genitalia for men uh, as much as it did anything else. And that's not separate from this. this the, the gender component of this is a part of the racist violence toward the black community. Black men as victims is not accidental. It's not coincidental. It's not happenstance. It's, it's been very much a targeted dynamic. And I think it needs to be called out as such if we're going to have a real conversation about what we're actually experiencing in these protests and, and what kind of targeting black males suffer from. Right? And that includes, of course, the, the multiple acts of violence that we pay attention to. I mean, we can talk about uh, a number of different occurrences that have led to this. But at the end of the day, um, the majority of the time when we talk about the unjust violence in the black community, we find the relationship toward white aggression and black males to be very much a key theme. Right. So obviously we can talk about, uh, you know, uh, George Floyd. We can talk about um Hold on, that's, ah, I lost my little web page here for a second. There we go, sorry about that. Um, we could talk about a number of different dynamics. Um, again, George Floyd, we could talk about uh, Breonna Taylor, we could talk about Tony McDade, we could talk about Ahmaud Arbery. Uh, in each of these situations, black maleness has a very interesting role in this, right? George Floyd, obviously, as a you know fairly large black male, uh, we see it took four officers to kill him, um, even though he, he didn't significantly resist in any, in, in any particular way and didn't commit a crime worthy of being abused and murdered, right? But obviously just the optics of him as a black male was enough to initiate a violent response. When we talk about something like Breonna Taylor, we have to address the injustice of her being killed within her home simply because of this no-knock policy. But it's interesting to note that the police officers who had the wrong address, apparently, were looking for um, what they considered to be drug dealers and so on and so forth. I would bet money that that was code for black men. And when they shot into the house, I don't think they were particularly uh, confused about that dynamic, right? Tony McDade, if you're not familiar with Tony McDade, this is an interesting and sad story of a trans man. So this is, this is somebody who was born uh, biologically female, um, and was uh, killed about five days ago. Um, I have an article on motherjones.com you can check out uh, May 29th, written by Laura Thompson. Um, and basically it says Wednesday evening, and um, let me see, um, the Tallahassee uh, police say that McDade was a suspect in a fatal stabbing that occurred shortly before his death. Police say he was armed with a handgun and he made a move consistent with using a firearm against the officer. And from that point, they shot him. Now this was, uh, you know, again, this was a trans man who, if you look at pictures of McDade, you know, um, appeared to be uh, male. And so I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit in terms of why that is and what, what we can glean from that. Um, 
you know, but, but again, the role of black maleness in this dynamic needs to be drawn out. Now, in terms of current events, one of the newest reports that came out today, uh, I have an article from CNBC News, is that three more cops charged in the George Floyd death, other officers murder charge upgraded. Right. So, you know, it says three former Minneapolis police officers were charged Wednesday with aiding and abetting murder in connection with the death of George Floyd in their custody. Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison announced Wednesday. Derek Chauvin, a fourth uh, a former officer who had already been charged with third degree murder and second degree manslaughter, will now also be charged with second degree murder, Ellison said. Uh, we are here today because George Floyd is not here, Ellison, a Democrat, said at a news conference announcing the charges. Ellison predicted that the prosecution of the officers could take months and urged the public to be patient as his office builds cases. Now, this is important because many people are already frustrated with the inability that many uh, police uh, institutions have with monitoring themselves, right? You know, we we routinely see police officers that initiate uh, brutality and homicide against citizens being uh, released and transferring to other departments um, without much difficulty. And so I think early on, uh, when uh, Chauvin wasn't immediately arrested, people began to feel this would happen. And then you had this strange um, autopsy that came out that basically argued that they couldn't determine what killed um, Floyd. Right. They, they made the suggestion it may have been a pre-existing condition, but they couldn't actually come to any kind of clear consensus. And luckily, there was a, a I believe it was a private um, autopsy performed where they did identify asphyxiation. But again, all of that speaks to the ability for the police to oversight themselves. And we, we've been questioning that uh, for decades and, and rightly so. So with the added pressure of the uprisings, uh, we can see that there's there's some fire being lit under people's behinds to uh, actually begin to push for some type of, of, you know, justice being pushed. Now the question becomes, over the next few months, when things die down, will there be enough pressure to make sure that this doesn't uh, slide under the radar, right? Um, let's see, pull up another report here. Now, just a bit of random news uh, at a couple points. Um, let's see, we have rapper Eve, who talks about the difficulties. This is an article on Bossip.com of um, discussing the protests with her in her interracial marriage. She says, I'm having some of the most difficult conversations I've ever had with my husband. Um, and this is an aspect of interracial marriage that is highly uncomfortable for many and, and, and uh, needs to be addressed. And that is um, talking about racism long before these incidents pop up. And so this, this article may, you may find of interest where she is trying to discuss that and at the same time um, have her husband understand what that means. Right. Um, another piece of, of pop culture news, we have XXL.com, um, XXLMag.com, excuse me, article about Tokyo Jets making George Floyd joke faces backlash. Uh, apparently, she said at a certain point, I'm going to George, Flo uh, George Floyd, your MF and ass um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a rhyme, I imagine. Um, but it speaks to, um, well, let me see, it says, following the backlash she faced after mocking uh, George Floyd's death, Tokyo Jets has issued an apology. Her statement follows an Instagram story video in which she said, um, I'm a George Floyd you. So um, I can't cuss on here, really. Well, yeah. Anyway, um, in a video posted uh, to Instagram on Monday, the 25 year old rapper took accountability for actions. There's no excuse. That is not what this is at all. I'm doing I'm not doing this video to ask for no type of sympathy because what I did was as wrong as hell. First and, and foremost, I want to apologize to the family to people on the front lines, to people who actually stand up for this. I don't want anybody to take nothing I'm saying as an excuse. So it, it in many ways speaks to how in pop culture, we, we, we take these kind of, you know, assassinations, we take these ty types of tragedies and they just become, you know, discussion. They become up for grabs in terms of what they mean. And we, we really dismiss um, the humanity of the people who are enduring these situations, in this instance, George Floyd. And so we need to be very careful and I think we need to challenge the ways in which we can tend to take certain things for granted, right? Um, 
another article up. This is on Upworthy.com. This is actually an article about one Tarana Burke who talks about an eye-opening story of why her partner wouldn't carry a pink tote bag. Basically, in this story, she's having a conversation with her partner, and at a particular point, he needs a bag, and she hands him a pink one. And when he suggests that he doesn't want to take it, she begins to um, chastise him about his sexism and being unwilling to carry a pink bag. And he explains that the reason is, as a large black man, walking down the street, especially in front of police officers, with a pink bag in hand, uh, might be misconstrued as him having stolen something. Right? From there, she talks, he recounts an evening where his car has been vandalized and she actually goes to the house that I think is right near the car and bangs on the door, um, you know, believing that they have committed this act uh, on her partner's car. And the police show up and instead of um, addressing the people in the house, they begin to address her partner. So this, this whole piece is about her coming to grips with how much she didn't understand about the realities of living as a black male how much needs to be taken into account and what kinds of different situations black males find themselves in that uh, she as a black woman was completely unprepared for and had not processed. So it's a very interesting story and somewhat ironic because as the founder of Me Too, the question needs to be thus asked. If we have hashtags like Believe Her, how does that affect the lives of black men? Right. If we're talking about, you know, if, 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 if we can understand that walking down the street with a purse may make you a victim of police brutality as a black man or a calling the police because your car got vandalized can make you a victim. Can you be a victim at the very idea that any woman that makes an accusation without qualification or evidence is enough to justify a, an arrest? Can that can we understand that as pot potential theoretical and state violence against black men? Right. The question has to be asked if you're willing to consider that these things happen to black men more readily than they happen to other groups. So, you know, an important question. Now, these two next reports um, I want to talk about together for a moment because they speak to, you know, what is continuing to happen since the death of George Floyd. Um, we have an article on AMP.Courier. Um, dash journal.com entitled my son didn't hurt nobody david mccaddy uh, and i may be mis mispronouncing that david mccaddy or mccaddy louisville business owner killed by authorities right and from here in louisville uh david mccaddy who turned his talent for food in a popular west end eatery was shot and killed by law enforcement officers early monday morning an incident that's now under state local and federal investigation right mccaddy the owner of yaya's barbecue in western louisville was known as a community pillar Said his mother, Odessa Riley, he left a great legend behind. He was a good person. Everybody around him would say that. My son didn't hurt anybody. He didn't do nothing to nobody, right? Riley was among the hundreds who had swarmed the corner of 26th and Broadway Monday where Louisville police and National Guard personnel were breaking up a large crowd that had gathered in the parking lot outside of Dino's Food Mart, according to law enforcement uh, officials. Uh, and from there, they say that somebody shot at police officers and they, um, the police officers and soldiers, and they returned fire, killing the caddy. Right? So this is interesting. I mean, we have this somebody shot at us kind of narrative as justification for killing uh, often unarmed people. Uh, nonetheless, uh, we have uh, the loss of another black male in the protest of losing black males. Right. Another similar uh, story is, is dated June 1st. It's updated. I should have said it's dated May 31st, but updated June 1st. BuzzFeedNews.com reports that a 22-year-old black man was fatally shot at a protest against police brutality outside an Omaha bar. Right. Uh, on Monday, Douglas County attorney Don Klein said that the owner of the bar acted in self-defense and will not face charges. Um, and apparently uh, it was the owner that shot this young man, 22-year-old black man protesting police brutality, um, shot Saturday night uh, outside the bar. James Skurlock died after being shot around 11 p.m. in the Old Market neighborhood of Omaha. He was transported to the Nebraska Medical Center where he was pronounced dead. Omaha police said they have taken into custody an individual connected to the shooting but refused to provide further details. Several news outlets have identified the shooter as the owner of a couple of local bars. Nationwide, thousands um, 
the protesters demonstrated against the death of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, who were unarmed and killed by police. So we have these two men to add to that list, James Scurlock, right, and David McCaddy, um, simply for participating in the protests. So it's interesting, again, going back to the lion metaphor, where you see black men at the forefront of being targeted and identified. And part of what I argue with this is that th this is an ongoing practice. This is an ongoing practice of identifying black men as these uh, ultra monsters that need to be taken down. And what we often don't admit to is that, that many um, have a thrill. They take, they take as, as we might say, uh, a certain type of perverse pleasure in the assassination of random black men, much the way they do with big game hunting, right? Even so far as there being a legacy of pictures, uh, particularly of white men standing over the bodies of black men uh, in a, a kind of uh, celebratory conquering of the black male body, right? Now this is actually, I have a term for this that I've developed in my work, um, particularly looking at anti-black misandry. And I identify about 10 different forms of misandry, and one of them is uh, dealing with what I refer to as homoeroticism. And that has to do with the literal and figurative consumption of the black male body. The eating of the black male is a form of cannibalism sustained by a homoerotic, homoerotic sexual urge of racism, right? The erotic found in white men's domination of black men is by its very nature sexualized and suggests a transfer of sexual power as hypermasculine black men are seen as conquests by white men, big game to be hunted um, to affirm uh, their hypermasculinity. So this type of conquering of black males is precisely uh, what we're seeing happening in an unchecked capacity right now. Um, and it's, it's such that it impacts those who, you know, anybody who even you know, dons the appearance of being a black male. And this is why I go back to Tony McDade in this instance. If you look at pictures of McDade, who again is a, a transgender man born biologically female, you notice, you know, that he looks very much male in that regard. Um, and you can see how that dynamic plays out in when you talk about police brutality uh, and police homicide, particularly of black males, right? Um, so in that, I posted some information a little bit earlier before my show on social media, and I used it on my last YouTube video. Um, for those who haven't had a chance to check out the, the Onyx Report on YouTube, I highly urge that you do. You can put in T. Hassan Johnson, and from there you can actually go and, and, and to the channel itself and look up the various videos. The last one I have is posted. It's called Stop Playing with Black Male Deaths. And it deals uh, very explicitly with some of the numbers behind the killings. Now, the reason I bring this up is because there has been a great deal of tension this last week, most especially, but it's really been going on for a good number of years now, where the question of how much attention black males should have when they're killed is, is hotly debated. The argument is that black males have a certain type of privilege. They have the privilege of being hyper-focused upon in terms of uh, being killed, most especially due to law enforcement or vigilante um, homicide. And so, the, you know, the argument is that there's not enough attention being paid to black women and to LGBT groups. And this has been hotly debated for a good number of years now, and it has reached, I would argue, a crescendo where you're seeing it in social media and people send me, you know, quite a bit of this. So I've, I've been reading, you know, post after post on Twitter and Facebook where you have people fighting back and forth over this and clear statements, uh, misandric statements uh, about black men uh, usurping too much attention in the conversation. I've read everything from statements saying you niggas can't die fast enough to you know, I'm no longer supporting black men. I will not march for black men who are killed. Uh, but this is interesting because black men do not control any of the, the platforms, the media platforms where our deaths in the community are discussed on a national, uh, you know, uh, platform, a national stage. Black men don't control any of those spaces. I have a show on Inner Light Radio where I talk about it. I don't control a national platform to determine which deaths are talked about. But 
there, this hostility between the two has come about because the argument is that somehow black men are not paying enough attention to others' deaths. And even though they are rightly frustrated about their own, that that's, uh, that's, that's the issue at hand. So what I decided to do was actually post some numbers so we can actually get at the core of what is happening and how we understand it, right? When we talk about police homicide in the black community. So I put up a chart you can find on my Facebook page and it's entitled Police Homicide in the Black Community by Race and Gender, 2015 to 2019. Now, I would argue that these numbers are low. Uh, one of the reasons for that is if you look at uh, the two, there's three main sources I use for this chart, right? There's the Guardian's website, The Counted, um, which covers 2015 and 2016. And there's the Washington Post Fatal Force, which covers 2017 through 2019, right? But if you look at the Washington Post's uh, website, they specifically talk about police who shot black males, which is a little different, right? So it's, it's possible that if someone were, say, choked, they may or may not show up on that list. So that you, sometimes you have to be very careful about the language they're using. And then, of course, other times it's a question of whether or not people's deaths have been reported at all. And for example, if you have a, a prisoner who's killed by a guard, you know, that may not register when it comes to police homicide in terms of any formal reporting. So that said, I would argue that the numbers that I'm going to read off are probably low for all groups involved. But operating with empirical data is still better than just operating off of opinion. Because if you operate off opinion, then it becomes a matter of feeling what you feel is happening versus what is actually happening. Right. So in terms of this chart that I created, I look at the deaths from 2015 to 2019. One of the things we see is in 2015, there were 12 black women who were killed by police officers. Right. There was 295 black men. In 2016, there were 13 black women killed by police officers. And in, in, in that same year, we had 253 black men. In 2017, we had nine black women killed. Right. And we had 214 black men. 2018, we had 10 black women killed by police officers and we had 219 black men. And in 2019, we had six black women killed by police and 230 black men. Something else to add to that, according to a national epidemic, a fatal, uh, excuse me, According to the publication, a national epidemic, fatal anti-transgender violence in the United States in 2019, what we find is there are an average of 20 to 26 transgender homicides that take place per year across race. Out of that 20 to 26 transgender um, homicides, only 3% are police initiated. Now, the majority of those transgender homicides are black, but 3% of them are police initiated. So if you take 3% of 20 to 26, you're roughly talking about one person, right? So when the whole question of police homicide comes up, we have difficulty talking about black men because the assumption is that by doing so, we are purposely erasing others. We are fixing the, the subject on black males and we are eliminating others and that it in and of itself is a sexist or, uh, you know, exclusionary act. But we don't do this for other things, right? If we look at, if you take breast cancer, for example, breast cancer in the black community, you've got about two to 4% of black men who get breast cancer. And this can be a lethal, you know, form of cancer as most, you know, many of them are, right? Most of them are. But nobody suggests that because two to 4% of black men are suffering from breast cancer that we now have to discuss it as a black issue because we don't we discuss it as a black women's issue. You know, if we, if we talk about single parenthood, even though you got, I think it's roughly 4% black male, you know, parents, single fathers, we don't talk about single parenthood as a black issue. We talk about it as a black woman's issue, right? For some reason, it is acceptable to include everybody when black men are the primary group suffering. But when it's specific to other groups, we actually ignore black men. So my theory about this is we actually are, are happy with a flat blackness when it comes to, you know, moving the focus away from black males. 
but somehow it's acceptable when it's specific to other people. Now, let me also add, in terms of the numbers I read, I focused on uh, you know, cisgendered heterosexual men and women. I focused on trans men and women. But you know, obviously, we need to include um, you know L G and B, right? We're talking about uh, you know lesbian, gay, and bi. And where do they fit in this chart? Well, we know according to UCLA, there was a recent report. Well, it's not recent. This is done in 2011. I haven't had a chance to see the updated numbers, but I still thought it was incredibly important. And I talked about this in, in the video I posted. Um, but you actually have a report from the UCLA's Women, uh, Williams Institute, which is a think tank that specializes in law and public policy related to sexual orientation. You have Gary J. Gates, who wrote or co-wrote the Gay and Lesbian Atlas. And what Gates and uh, Judy Bradford, director of the Center for Population Research and LGBT Health, talk about are the actual numbers of gay, bi, les, and trans folk across the nation. And by and large, you know, the general argument that it made is that they comprise about 10% of the population. This is pulled from the Alfred, the Alfred um, uh, Kinsey Institute, but it was never actually meant to be a number that was proffered as, as a real number. So when they actually did the research, they found that it was actually about 3.8% of society, right? So, so basically what that means in the black community is roughly about 1.6 percent one point excuse me 1.6 million black folk out of 43 million are likely gay les and bi and trans that said if we apply that to these numbers you you, you can kind of get a sense of what i mean <clears throat> right so we can say that you know 1.6 percent of the deaths we're looking at are likely gay bi les and trans for i talked about trans specifically because we found data for that so the idea is that overwhelmingly the target of police homicide are cisgendered heterosexual black men. And you'll rarely he hear people say that out loud because we're so used to being shamed about not saying it because we've been taught that to actually focus on black men is somehow to distract from focusing on others. And the two things don't have to coexist. You can actually talk about black men and it not be a purposeful slight at anybody else, let alone black women, children, or by LGBT. It doesn't have to be a slight at all. It's simply an acknowledgement of an empirically verified fact that when it comes to police homicide, heterosexual black males are the primary target. Just like in the same vein, we can talk about high blood pressure and the impact that it has on distinct groups. And that doesn't have to be a slight to any other group, as a matter of fact. And I'll say as an aside, you know, those who have followed my social media for years know that I generally tend to focus on um, the leading causes of death every year, right? So basically, um, National Center for Injury Prevention and Control, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, and the National Center for Health Statistics, uh, alongside the National Vital Statistics System, produce a report annually on uh, death by race and gender, the top 10 causes of death. They actually have top 5, 10, and 20 causes of death. I usually present the top 10 causes um, every year to kind of update us on the condition of the black community, right? And this year, I just really, I just posted some of the numbers a few days ago. Uh, it, it, the latest report is on 2018, and this is only for 18 states, but it still give us, gives us an empirical framework for what we're seeing, right? It gives us a, a snapshot, if you will, of the kinds of deaths we're looking at. So when we talk about from 2000, I mean, excuse me, from 1999 to 2018, what we see is that black men as of 2017 actually do supersede for the first time, really, black women in terms of heart disease. Prior to that, um, you know, black men died of, you know, the majority of different causes that they identified, except for heart disease, which in many ways was associated with age, so it, was ten it tended to be people over 55 that were suffering the greatest from heart disease, particularly over 65 and 75. But in 2017, we started to see more black men dying from it, even though many had died to exhaustion prior to even reaching uh, 65. You know, the life expectancy is around there for black men, which tends to be the lowest across race and gender. But in the 2018 report, what we see is that black, black men are dying in the highest numbers due to heart disease, due to, um, let me see here, malignant neoplasms, cancer, due to unintentional injury, which I argue also likely includes workplace injury, workplace uh, deaths, right? Uh, let me see, it also includes 
uh, where'd it go? Uh, homicides, right? Where in terms of what's been reported, um, black men, there've been over 144,863 homicides in the black community. And usually the age for that, for black males ranges from one years old to 54, right? So you've had 144,000 uh, plus deaths since 1999, um, you know, for black males from the age of one all the way up to 54. Now understand overall what I'm saying, when you look at these charts, and again, these are on my social media. If you're not, you know, if you haven't friended me on Facebook, if you'd like to see these things, go ahead and sign on to Facebook and friend me. Um, Twitter is messing up right now, so they're not usually letting me post my post from Facebook, so I'm trying to fix that. But anyway, what we see is that black males die in higher numbers from in the womb to age 75. For every five year increment from in the womb to age 75, black men die in higher numbers. And the top 10 things that they die from our heart disease, cancer, unintentional injury, cerebrovascular disease, homicide, diabetes, chronic low respiratory disease, nephritis, HIV, and septicemia. These are the top 10 causes of death that impact black men, right? And they're dying in increasingly high numbers every year, now superseding even black women in most categories, right? These are the things that I'm trying to bring attention to because when we talk about the issues in the black community, we have a way of boiling them down and quickly dismissing them rather than actually tying them together and looking at the larger picture of what is happening with black men. And I think it's important that we learn to do that because it, 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 it's, it affects our well-being, it affects our standing, it affects our quality of life. And in those kind of ways, we develop perspectives that I think we tend to overlook. So, for example, when I talked about the rapper who made George Floyd into a lyric uh, or, you know, something to be dismissed in a joke, that's not uncommon. But part of the reason that happens is because of the frequency of our deaths. Or I'll give you another random thing. You know, there's a, there was recently a Jesse Jackson led uh, voter town hall on Saturday, May 3rd. Uh, and this was uh, pushed by Rainbow Push Coalition. And there were all in all about seven uh, speakers outside of Jackson himself. I think he was more like the moderator or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so yes, this again was the, the was a, you know, a rainbow push event on May 30th, uh, Saturday. And it's, it, 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 uh, presented Angela Rye, Barbara Arnwin, Kristen Clark, Latasha Brown, Nikki Robinson, Tiffany Lofton, Jessica Fortune Barker. Now I apologize if I mispronounced any of those names, but if you notice by listening very close, closely, um, there were no men present other than Jesse Jackson. And we see something similar happening to the numbers of people going into electoral representation. The numbers of black males are dwindling fast. And one could argue that a lot of this is tied to education. Right? Since, the, since the 1970s, black men have gotten half of the college degrees black women have gotten. So what is the impact of that? Well, if you're in a country that has framed uh, higher education as the entrance to the middle class in the 1970s, but you have half the degrees of you know, black women, you can see the impact it'll have over generations in terms of black men being present in politics, being present in white collar jobs, and being present in any kind of professional standing and leadership in the community. It has a direct effect, education. And this is one of the things that we have to come to grips with. The position of black males as participants in the black community is dwindling and dwindling fast. And even when we go back to or come back to the discussion about protests, <clears throat> there are gender dynamics that have to be taken into account. Uh, if you go to YouTube, you can look up a, a colleague of mine. He, he titles himself Green Gorilla on YouTube, the G with the PhD. And he, he posted a video recorded by one Darren Seals. And some of you, may, <clears throat> excuse me, some of you may remember Darren Seals from, um, you know, uh, a, a number of years ago, he was very active in Ferguson um, and he was very highly critical and publicly, publicly critical of uh, Black Lives Matter in Ferguson at that time. And one of the things he, 
he was one of the first to alert us about were the ways in which protest organizations could move into an area and appropriate the attention and resources that should have gone to the local families and organizations that were developing, usurp those resources and then quickly move on to the next place. And Darren, through a number of recorded videos and even tweets, um, talked about how this happened in Ferguson and, and how exactly everyday grassroots people who were trying to pull together after a death of the love of their loved one were not able to form the kind of nonprofit organizations in time to actually receive the resources that could have helped them from the ground up. And yet you had organizations that were able to swoop in and kind of do that. And there's also some class kind of dimensions to that because the people that tended to be in a position where they could do that tended to be more highly educated as well as tied in to the, um, what would you call it? The uh, nonprofit industrial complex framework. If you remember, uh, I had one Nyota Uhuru on my show a few months ago. She was also a friend of Darren Seals and she's an active uh, um, activist out there and she still is. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna read her assessment of um, these current protests in a moment because I think it's powerful and it's, it's poignant and it needs to be needs to be grasped. But she also backed Darren Seals' statements up about what took place in Ferguson and by extension, what took place in different cities around the country as only certain organizations became known, right? So even to this day on my, my campus at Fresno State, when the administration called many of the faculty in to figure out how to, to, to frame a response to what's been going on, the only black organization that they could pull from was Black Lives Matter because that's the organization that was in the news. But what that often did, what that kind of thing often does, and we see it in the protests, we're seeing young white protesters spray painting Black Lives Matter on all kinds of different things. And that's, of course, a problem on one level, because it makes black people responsible for something that they, they may not even be doing. Uh, where you have white pro protesters who don't necessarily understand uh, the intricacies of what's going on in the black community, who may even be trying to support, but in turn, you may be contributing to the vilification of black protesters. So you have that dimension of it. But another dimension of it is you have an erasure of the kind of grassroots level organizations that formed in each city in response to the conditions they were dealing with in response to the deaths and the homicides they were facing and the attention and again, the resources were usurped away from those grassroots organizations, especially organizations that were initiated in many instances by men the fathers, you know, the uncles, the cousins of the black males that were killed, right? So if we go back to Hillary Clinton a couple of years ago when she's doing the Democratic Convention and she begins to publicize the mothers of the movement, these are mothers who lost their sons to police homicide. One of the things that you didn't see on that stage were the fathers, the uncles, the cousins, the sons, they were invisible. Now, that is no in no way black women's fault. I, I really think, you know, in terms of, you know, have, in Western culture, we have difficulty empathizing with black men or really black males. We have enough to be enraged and that can get, uh, you know, white America's uh, attention. That can get the, glo the globe's attention. We're seeing protests all around the world. But how much of that is actually translated into policy that defends and protects black men? How much of it, it translates into resources given to organizations whose mission statements target the protection of black men? I'll wait, right? How many of these things actually end up resulting in a dramatic shift in how you know, the, the law enforcement is practiced in regard to black men? I think the answer is implicit in the question because we've gone you know, from Emmett Till you know, to George Floyd. And there has been very little break in the consistency of black male deaths, right? So even in our response to it, there is a, a kind of competition for resources that shapes the way we interpret and act on protecting those who are being most targeted by the police whom we pay, you know, pay for with our taxes. We pay to contribute to this kind of annihilation of black male life. And, and even for those that aren't killed, the annihilation of actually just being secure in the society you live in, 
You know, I can say that I literally started having interactions with police at about 13 years old, where they would throw you over the hood of their car, pat you down, and if you didn't have anything, they may throw you on the ground and drive away. At least that's what I experienced. Or they may keep you there for questioning until they felt like letting you go. I've been pulled out of line standing in the movie theaters. I've had guns drawn on me simply because I was walking to school and they said I looked like a criminal two cities over that knocked over a Domino's pizza two weeks prior. Right? Guns drawn. Three or four police cars pulling up to a screech, pulling out guns. And I had my earphones on, plus I'm in shock. And luckily, you know, even though I didn't respond as quickly to their demands as, as um, you know, we might say would be safe because I was in shock. Plus, I didn't even know that it happened for a moment because I had earphones on. I could have very easily been shot just for that. And I never told my mother about those things when they happened because I saw her stressed out as it was just taking care of her family. So those are things I ended up keeping to myself until much later on when I would talk to other black men who had very similar stories. And our stories were so similar that we were used to the stress and the tension that came with living through that. We knew that you didn't even have to leave your house like we saw with Breonna Taylor, a no-knock policy. You, You could experience that at any point in time. You know? And, 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 you know, right. My producer's telling me he's meant and they can plant stuff on you too, which happened to a cousin of mine. You know, a police officer saw him driving a car that he didn't feel my cousin should be able to drive and literally planted drugs on my cousin and took him to jail simply because, and it's your word against the police officers, right? But as a black male, This becomes part and parcel to your everyday experience. Now, going back to the Tarana Burke article, you can see that there is a critical difference in the realities and the life experiences of many black men and women. This was not something Tarana could fathom. It did not, for her, it didn't reach the point of, um, you know, an implicit understanding because it wasn't her experience. And that isn't to diminish the experiences that black women have. It is simply to point out that black men have a very different one. And acknowledging that is not misogynist, it's not sexist, and it needs to be something that black men learn how to do without being shamed. And I urge black men to use the data available to them to really gain a better understanding of what it is we experience, right? Then do so without apology even to the extent that we begin to actually talk about things like, you know, uh, sexual vulnerability and victimization and, you know, intimate partner violence. One of the reports that came out this week is that Faith Evans had, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, intimately attacked her husband or partner. I don't know if they're married, but anyway, um, she had physically assaulted him and he called the police and she was taken in. She got out on bail. I don't know what happened after that. But that was in the news as well, right? I think similar things may have happened with, you know, people like Mary J. Blige. But at the end of the day, we laugh these things off. But when you begin to look at the statistics and you find that black males actually suffer from intimate partner violence at relatively equal numbers as as women, now we have to learn how to have a different conversation. And this is a conversation that black males have to initiate unapologetically because it speaks to the same experiences that we're having in society as a whole, whether you're being beat up by police officers or being falsely charged with an an accusation of assault or threat simply because you're black male and maybe even large. And if you can, and people can believe that you threatened them simply on the basis of what you look like, even if the people falsely accusing you are in your community, we now have to have a critical conversation about what exactly black men need to start doing. And this is what I mean when I talk about uh, it ain't no fun when the lion gets the gun. When black males get tired of being falsely accused, of being attacked, of being of having their lives and deaths dismissed, or having their deaths used by others to garner attention for resources, for grants, for you know fellowships, for you know for various types of monies. Right. When black male deaths become cannon fodder for other people to advance their political careers or the dem- or, 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 or politically advance a particular demographic that is not black and male, but our deaths become useful 
in that venture, there's a problem. And I think it needs to be called out. It needs to be addressed overtly. And it can't be based on just what we feel or don't feel about a given issue. We gotta actually look at as much of the data as possible to really get an assessment of who is experiencing what and to what extent. And believe it or not, I'm not saying that that says that one thing is important and another isn't. That's not what it means. It just means that we simply acknowledge what is happening and what isn't. You know, so again, when we talk about black males, we can actually legitimately say that there are there are people who are being abused and killed and they are part far more the norm. And then you still have people who are being abused and killed who might be exceptions to the rule. It doesn't mean that nobody's death is important at all. But at the same time, it's an erasure of black male deaths to suggest that we, we can just treat it like it's the same issue across different uh, demographic contexts simply because we feel like it. That's not how this works. If black men are 90% of the people dying by police homicide, then how come we can't treat it as such? Why has that become synonymous with a disrespectful statement to point out what is obvious? And it shouldn't be. And I'm tired of looking at educated black men with doctorates tap dance around the numbers to say things that make people feel comfortable and deny the actual deaths of black men. Because as I pointed out to you for the last five years, there's been no less than 200 black men dying per year, two to 300. So that means we're talking about in a five year period, 1,000 to 1,500 black men dead. Now, in all honesty, just let me ask you, how many of you can, how many names can you remember from the last five years of black men killed? Don't worry, I'll wait. Three, four, five. God forbid you lost somebody in your family and that's why you remember a name that most won't. But at the end of the day, when we think about black males deaths due to, to, to police homicide, that's all we can really remember is a handful, three or four. And we ignore a thousand to damn near 1500 other names. Now we definitely can talk about homicide in the black community. And there've been many people, including myself, who've been pushing against this by men developing mentoring programs and trying to work with young men in particular who are killing themselves. And it's not limited to young men, but we, th that's definitely a conversation we can have because the issues that produce that are more often than not environmental. They're conditions that are, that are, that are shaped by really poverty for the most part. And if you look at the numbers, every group kills itself in higher numbers. That's not limited to black America by any means. But at the end of the day, we still find that black males, regardless of who's killing them, and it actually in one vein doesn't matter if other black males are doing it to the extent that black males are still suffering. We can talk about the blame of black men killing one another, but we can't talk about black, black men being victims even to each other. That, that's not the angle we're allowed to take because we have to be critical of black males, but we gotta, we gotta be, maybe we gotta be very controlled on how we implement any degree of empathy. And the empathy we're allowed to, uh, to display needs to be done in a way that does not benefit black males as a whole, even though they're dying. We have to, we have to tap dance around it so other people won't be mad. And I, you know, at this point, I'm like, I sat through, what, 16 years of higher education give or take a couple years, I, I took off and got married. And in that 16 years, the discussion on black males never went beyond the surface. We never talked about black boys who were sexually victimized. We never, it, it, incarceration, we, we would spend a couple of minutes on and quickly move on because it was understood that black men were incarcerated. And that was kind of it. But there was never a deep dive into the, into the various issues that black males face. We weren't allowed to. And when I sat in gender classes, gender didn't include black males, but somehow black males didn't have a gender. The only people that had gender was everybody else. So black males at every age, especially if they were straight, were not part of the discussion unless they were perceived as villains, unless they were perceived as the initiators of violence in homes. And that was the only time we could talk about it. And that was it. And that needs to change because it's not accurate, right? We have reports I don't have it in front of me and I wish I did. I, I forgot to pull it up, but I believe it was in Atlanta. There was a young brother who was on the police department and he asked if he could actually participate in the protest. 
And I think it was his police captain that said no. Took off his badge, walked outside and participated with the people protesting. We don't see those stories of black men who are on the front lines in different ways and, and, and actually advocating, regardless of where they're coming from, for their own lives. Because to do so is considered inherently a problem. Now, I want to read a statement by, again, Nyota Uhura, who is an activist that I really respect, who I believe still resides in Ferguson. And she made an assessment that I thought merited reflection about what's been going on lately. It's a little long, so bear with me, um, but I will try and get through it as smoothly and quickly as, as possible. And this was posted last night right, on, on Facebook, and it was public, so uh, I'm sharing it publicly as I shared it on my page. And she says, morning fam, it's time to assess. On the surface, the protests look like a path to, to change, but the reality is very different. The George Floyd protests have been co-opted. There are various forces at play on the left and right playing on our emotions, exploiting the murder of George Floyd and the George Floyd protests for their own agenda. That's why the demographics look so different. Yes, there are white people who stand in solidarity, but there are also those who embed themselves within the protest to sabotage and create havoc agents and agent provocateurs. There have been media reports of white supremacists using the George Floyd protest for their own agenda. The NPIC, Watch News Org's prop up, watch millions, hundreds of millions be pledged to BLM and M4BL to help us. Money that goes into their coffers and funds everything from LGBTQ issues to immigration. Everything except justice for black people. The Urban League and NAACP are worse. They've been pimping our struggle for decades. All these orgs receive millions of dollars pimping black issues. Where are the results? Where are our independent institutions? Where is our legal legal team? Or are the or are the sell ass action suits against the Democratic Party for generations of disastrous policies that destroy the black family, black community, and locked up millions of black men? Uh, we see the propping up of respectable, broken, and failed Negroes. Those who spent their entire careers cowering, tail tucking, and yassa Boston being popped up in the, propped up in the media. Negroes who have been missing in action and do not represent black interests, like members of the CBC. Negro leaders who failed black people for years see what little influence they had dwindled to none. They're reaching and grabbing, crying and begging. They must not be moved by their, we must not be moved by their tears or sudden commitment to justice for the murder of unarmed black people. Not one of them can show a single piece of legislation passed to protect black people from abusive policing. The Democrat Party, believe it or not, is the greatest ringleader, along with the left propaganda arm of the media, who benefits most from the George Floyd protests, Democrats. It diverts attention away from Democrat mayors and their horrible responses to COVID. It takes the attention away from Joe Biden Goffs, Tara Reid, his record, and our demand for tangibles. Minneapolis has a Democrat DA, the state, a Democrat attorney general, a black Democrat attorney general. Both have the power to unilaterally charge all four officers. Well, as of today, we know they did. You know, she says, uh, she goes on to say, instead they're allowing the disruption in cities to burn, hoping Trump being Trump and anti-Trump sentiment will help them at the polls. Watch how all this energy morphs to get out to vote. Vote for the very people and party that control po police in our communities that refuse to hold officers accountable for killing us. Keith Ellison could have made the call to arrest all four officers the day he took over. He didn't and instead gave us a lot of word salad about a rush to judgment while setting low expectations. Keith Ellison, Ellison slash Democrats could end the protest today by charging all four officers, um, but they didn't, at least until this morning. Um, this is how they think they're going to beat Trump. No different than Hillary trotting around the mothers of the movement. Where is Hillary today? Now, what's interesting to note is that it shouldn't have had to take riots and protests that covered the globe in order for us to get to this point, but it did. So that said, I want all of us to be on our guard and make sure we hold people accountable and make sure we push for the kind of justice we need and move beyond feelings and actually make sure we know what we're talking about in terms of who's actually experiencing what. Now, y'all know how I like to close out my show, right? I'm here to tell brothers most specifically, we are not criminals by birth, perennial rapists, incapable intellects, man children, sperm donors, child support wellsprings, success objects, walking phalluses, ATM machines, lottery. I am here to tell you, brothers, we are not criminals by birth, perennial rapists, incapable intellects, man children, sperm donors, child support wellsprings, success objects, walking phalluses, ATM machines, lottery tickets, 
unpaid bodyguards, interchangeable stepfathers, child discipline proxies, unpaid repairmen, workhorses, or any other socially accepted dehumanizing stereotype. We are thinkers, inventors, innovators, leaders, fathers, and men. Embrace your humanity, know your worth, and extend your time, attention, and resources only to those who genuinely respect you. And remember, your worth is not defined by meeting other people's narcissistic, selfish, and unrealistic needs. You define your worth. Peace.